can say I've never come out to music before, but again, I do meet in a house every week for my church, so it'd be a bit weird if they just pressed play and then I stood up from the couch and uh, I am here. Uh, so that was a nice, dramatic entrance. I loved it. Thanks, Adam. Uh, and so this morning, I'm really excited to be back here and to get the opportunity to share with you a little uh, something that God's been really uh, teaching me and working in my heart over this past year while I've been away in Malvern doing this church plan, uh, as my dad mentioned. There's been a lesson that I feel, just this journey that I've been on, that I feel God's really been teaching me. And it kind of comes from this thing that sometimes you don't realize what you have until you don't have it. And, some, and for me, I found that when I moved away to Malvern, having been in Destiny, you move away and you've gone from having a community around you that raise you, that love you, that invest, and then you find yourself in a new place. You don't know many people, and everyone I do know is also in their 20s with not much experience. Uh, and so I find myself in this new place, like what do I do, where do I go, where are all these spiritual parents that I've had investing in me? And so I've been on this journey of unpacking what does it look like to be a spiritual parent? And as I was, knew I was coming back to destiny and thinking and praying about what to speak on, I felt God plant this seed in my heart of spiritual parenting. And although it might seem crazy, because at first I thought, but Destiny are doing that so well. Like, that's what Destiny saw, right? Like, I've never seen a church do it like Destiny. I mean, I am very biased as well. I do love Destiny. I always tell everyone, I think Destiny is Jesus' favorite church. Uh, but I get told off in Malvern for saying that. Everyone is desperate to come. I tell everyone about you. Every time someone has a problem, I go, well, let me tell you what Destiny do. And, I, and now I've started camouflaging it with just, there's this church I know, because everyone is about to tell me off for how much I mentioned Destiny. Because in my eyes, you guys are perfect. So, I, and I thought as I, as I come back and I talk about spiritual parenting, it seems crazy because they're doing it so well. And I felt God just tell me that maybe as the years have gone on and you get a little bit tired and you raise and then they leave and then you raise and then they leave the nest and you, you get a little bit, you start sitting on the timeout bench. And I felt God come to give me a little firecracker to put up your bum to say, get off the bench, to get back in play. God's still got an assignment for us to do. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you that you're already here we thank you that you're already moving, you're already speaking. God, we just pray that you will open our ears, open our hearts, open our eyes to what you're saying, and just give us the boldness to go away and to do it. Amen. Well, I don't know if you're like me, but I'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. Like, I absolutely love anything that's going to give me that, like, you know, heart racing kind of feeling. And to be honest, I get it most days from my own driving, but I do anything. <laughs> my dad just sits in my car, like, rattling. And so I just, I just love anything that just gives me that, like, belly flip moment. And there's something that I think gives me that moment more than anything else I've seen. I mean, I've been skydiving, and that is nothing. On the moment when you're just casually minding your own business, and you feel this tap on your shoulder as the five-year-old says, tag, you're it, and all of a sudden, I lose all sense of control. My heart is racing as I weigh up everyone's athletic ability, and I am desperate to find who is the weakest link that I can pass this invisible power that has been bestowed upon me to say, tag, you're it, and run to find freedom. And I mean, it doesn't matter how old you get. I think after this service, we should have a big game of tag, you're it. <laughs> we would soon remember it. That would be Daniel Plan certified. And so <laughs> and we should, there's something about it that just gets you going. And I've realized that although we say tag, you're it as a game, I, I, maybe you can relate, but I feel like that's just what life has become. Like, I remember growing up, and I used to always do a lot of DIY with my dad. I love doing DIY. I mean, at times, I didn't really want to do it. I just thought he needed the expert advice of eight-year-old me. So I got up, and I went to help and took the screwdriver off him and said, here, let me show you what you're doing wrong, and nothing's changed. And, so, and I always, you know, used to do DIY. I remember on Saturdays, we used to always go to Richmond to see my nana, and we used to do baking every week, and... 
Again, I, she, I didn't really sometimes want to. I just had to help her. You know, she didn't know how to make it without me. And, and so I went, Nana, step aside. Here I am. I'm showing you what to do. And, and as a child, I look back on all these things I used to do and, and how the people around me let me join in with what they're doing. And then all of a sudden, I find myself living in Malvern. And I go to open my front door and the handle falls off. And I wish I could just phone my dad and ask if he wants to drive five hours to come and fix it. But unfortunately, I feel like life went, tag, you're it. It's your turn to do what you've been shown to do. I have an event and we try our best to share life with those who don't know Jesus. And so we invite 20 young adults to come to our house and watch Bake Off. And I have this bright idea that we should also bake for them all. And then suddenly remember, my Nana's not here. And life just went, tag, you're it. It's your turn to step up and do what you've been shown. We all have it. You leave school, tag, you're it. Go get a job. Hey, uh, bills, finances, the tax man comes, tag, you're it. Time to start paying up. And we just have this game of tag, you're it. There's a time that comes where we all have to step up and do what we've been shown. And the reason when we're younger that we get involved, as much as I like to think I improved the DIY and the baking that, that I did, really I slowed the process down. My dad could have probably put the, the screw in in two seconds with his electric drill, but he lets me by hand turn, take a juice break, I go back, I turn, like, and he lets in, it's like five hours later and he's got the football on, he's probably watched that, come back, I'm still going. And it takes a lot longer and to be honest, it probably looks a bit wonky at the end. I, I know the cakes I made definitely didn't look as good as when my nana just made them alone. I, it, it, it's, we don't do it for the efficiency, we do it for the experience with the child, we don't do it for the results at the end. We do it because of the relationship. And I feel that in the same way we do that naturally, we just love to spend time with children, to have a shared experience, to invest in them, just to make some memories. It's the same in the spiritual. You see, Jesus comes down to earth and he finds 12 disciples. He often refers to them in in the Bible as his children, his beloved children. We describe God as our father. It's a spiritual kind of parenting relationship. Uh, And he comes and he has these uh, disciples and and he raises them and he invests and he shows them and they get it wrong and he corrects them and he just does the daily parenting thing. And then all of a sudden he has the most ultimate tag, you're it kind of moment before he scoots back up to heaven and sends a spirit down. And he has this moment where he stands there and he goes, hey, I've shown you it all. Now it's your turn. And it's the most ultimate one because this tagging power is still going on today and we've all been tagged with it and even talking about it is getting my adrenaline going a little bit because we've got this moment and it's in Matthew 28 when Jesus says this, he says, hey, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, hey, you've been tagged, go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. You see, we call this the Great Commission, the Great Core Mission. See, God could easily do this himself, do it a little bit quicker, and do it a lot better than we all can. But he says, that's not the experience I want. I want you as my children to come and join in. I will take a bit longer. You're going to mess up. The church is going to get messy, and everyone's going to fall out of parts. But hey, that's not the point. Come and join in. This is the core mission. It's the mission that we get to do together with our Father. And sometimes we can get a little bit deceived as Christians that like the call of God on our life is to be a great disciple. But it doesn't say, hey, therefore go and be a disciple. Baptize yourself in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach yourself to obey everything I've commanded and hey, I'm with you. It it doesn't say that, although there is an element that we, we need to do that, The call of God on our life isn't just to pursue God as an individual and just see where it takes us. The call of God can only be worked out in community as we go and raise a generation, as we pass on to the next generation what we have been given. And it can't be done through information alone. I didn't sit there with my nana and write the the elements of the recipe and write down how to use a spoon and how to use an electric whisk. It wasn't done through information. It was done through an invitation. 
Hey, come join. Hey, come, you try it. Oh, oh, no, you've messed that up. A little bit more flour, let me fix it. It is through an experiencing of coming to do it. And children, we all carry what has been passed on to us. I always chuckle, because every time I start speaking, everyone goes, Dean, where does this passion come from? And I only have to show a 10-second clip of my dad preaching and diving around the stage, and they all go, ah, that makes sense, that. And it doesn't take long when I moved to Malvern, a really affluent area. It's got more PhDs and scientists per square meter than like any other place, both of which I contribute nothing to. And I'm in, I'm in the most affluent area there is, and I spend my evenings walking around trying to find neighborhoods that look a little bit worse off than the average person. And they're going, Nadine, why do you spend your time doing that? And I go, let me tell you about Brian and Stella. They, they've put this heart on me that loves those that don't know Jesus. And, and then I start praying. They go, where does this prayer come from? And I go, let me tell you about Linda. And, and then I have sit in youth and they're going, Nadine, where does this confidence come from? You just seem to have this identity. I go, let me tell you about Tracy. Let me tell you about Tandy. Let me tell you about Beauty, my mom, Nana. Let me tell you about everyone back at Destiny. Why? because I am here because of what they have invested in me. See, we all go on this pursuit of self-discovery. We all try and find from inside our own body that which can only be found within Christ's whole body. And so we go soul searching to find ourselves, but that's not the call of God. The call of God says the only way you can get to who you've been called to be is when you come and join yourself with the whole community. And together we build a family and together we invest in others. But in the same way that kids can only be what is being modeled to them, for some that's a really great thing and for some that's not the best. For some there's a shadow side that they don't want to copy what they've seen. I think of, you know, when you're in like a family gathering and then like a kid what runs in and then they shout something really inappropriate and then run out and everyone's jaw drops and we all look around like, who told them that? And everyone's like, not me, not me, not me, no. Looking, looking around, eyes gazing. Why? Because they, they heard it from somewhere. They didn't just make it up. They've copied it from someone. And in the same way, I felt a little nudge this, this morning. There's going to be some people in this room that are going to say, hey, the example that's been set before me is not one that I want to copy and pass on to the next generations. Maybe generations before me have struggled with debt. Maybe generations before me have struggled to handle their emotions. Maybe generations before me have struggled with purity. Maybe generations before me have struggled with addiction. But hey, I'm going to be the generation that says it stops with me. I'm going to be the generation that puts my feet down and says that's not going to be the model that I set for the next following generations. I'm going to be the generation that makes a difference. And I think it's so important because we have a generation now rising up that don't have godly models. We have a generation now rising up whose parents aren't setting an example of how to love and live like Jesus. And that's why there's a call on the church to step in and to be spiritual parents for every person that comes into this place that is younger in faith and in age. To step up and say, I will be a lifestyle that you can model that you have not seen from anywhere else. We need to set an example of forgiveness when the world preaches cancel culture. We need to set an example of service when the, when the world is all about what can we gain. It's about our status. We need to set an example of generosity when the world's just trying to get rich. We need people who can have a different kind of lifestyle that sets a different uh, example for the next generation. But we've got a world that want to be influencers, politicians, entrepreneurs, Leaders, not many people say, hey, I want to be a spiritual parent. It's not really something that many people aspire to be because it's not seen, it's not visible. You don't get rich from it. You don't get famous from it. But in the Bible, it is of ultimate significance. Jesus says, hey, the best thing you can spend your life doing is raising up the next generation. In 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul tells us how to do it. How do you set an example? He says, hey, do it in speech, do it in conduct, do it in love, do it in faith, and do it in purity. All you've got to do is set an example. I want to ask you, can you offer your life as a living 
breathing example to be imitated. Because that's what it means to be a spiritual parent. That's what it means to be a disciple maker. It says this in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, verses 15 to 16. It says, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. Hey, although you've got loads of mentors, you've got loads of people who are out there trying to show you how to live, loads of people will invest one hour a week to give you a little bit of tutoring, but hey, you don't have many parents. For, for I became your father in Christ Jesus. Not biologically, this isn't like a DNA you know, result moment. He's just like, hey, I'm going to become your spiritual parent. I urge you then, be imitators of me. Like, imagine having that much confidence. If someone comes to faith and you're like, you want to know how to become like Jesus? Follow me. Like, that's like so much confidence in the lifestyle you're living. So much confidence. Hey, copy me. And where will you get? You'll get to Jesus. Hey, copy my lifestyle and you're going to look a little bit more like Jesus. That's got a confidence and a security in where you are heading. I wonder if a child imitated you, what would they become? Who would they become? What would they look like? Would it be someone that you even like? Would it be someone that Jesus likes? Someone that Jesus approves of? And and the point of this is it's not a a shame question. It's not about reaching perfection. You see, discipleship, it's not a destination, it's a direction. In other words, imagine here, this is me, like the furthest I could possibly ever be away from Jesus. Like this is the worst kind of version of me. And over here, like I am at one with Jesus. Like we are abiding all right. Like we are, like this is the best, most holiest, purest, best version of Nadine I ever could be. And the question isn't where are you on getting to the best version? The question is which direction are you facing? Are you moving towards that version? It's not about it. where are you? Are you here? Or are you here? Because you can have someone all the way over here who's just decided to turn and takes one step and is further on the discipleship journey than someone who's here who's got lazy, got distracted, and started wandering. Although on the outside they might look closer, on the inside they're not in the right direction. All you've got to do is be on the right direction. I'm advancing, I'm improving, I'm getting more like Jesus every day. It's not about where you're at, it's about where you're going. It says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we love you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, but our lives as well. When we're going to raise a generation, they need an all-access pass. I don't know if you've got children, but I mean, if you do have children, you kind of as well, I mean, I also don't have children, but I know what they're like. And sometimes you go to the toilet and the door swings open and they come in, you're like, there's just no boundaries. And I really enjoyed in the pandemic every time they were doing like interviews and then you would just see these kids barge in the back and then the wives like dragging them out. And I found it really entertaining. Go watch them on YouTube if you haven't. They're great. Why? Because kids don't have boundaries. They have this all access pass to your life wherever you are. Are, whatever you're doing, they don't understand that they are not always invited. They have an all access pass. What would it look like if we had Jesus followers that give the next generation an all access pass? In other words, I'm not just bothered about this one hour meeting that I can turn up and pretend my life's doing well. I'm not bothered about this edited version that I'm putting out on social media. I'm not bothered about you trying to follow the glimpses of my discipleship journey. Hey, come and look at me when I've just received some bad news and I really wish you weren't there, but you've invited yourself along. Come and look at me when I've got some disappointing news. Come and look at me when I've really messed up and I'm trying to get back on track. Have an all access pass to my life. Have an all access pass to come and imitate because discipleship it's not a program we launch it's a lifestyle we embrace Mark Twain once said this he said hey the the two he didn't say hey that was me he said he said the two most important days in your life are the day you we were born and the day you find out why Destiny, this is why we were born. This is why we have air in our lungs. This is why we have a pulse that's still being. If you're still here, there is still an assignment on your life that you have something to pass on. You've still got something that you need to model to the next generation. There is still something on your life that is not yet done. 
You know, I, I try and join in with Destiny whenever uh, I can. I try and catch up on YouTube uh, on the, the sermons and stuff. And I've tried to, uh, in my own way, be involved in the Daniel plan, though my dad still does not think I'm doing that well. <laughs> I got home and I, he was like, what are all these sweet packets? And I went, I've got some dates and mango. He said, but Nadine, they're not the ones that have been eaten. I was like, okay, that's true. But they're there, I'm doing better. And so <laughs> I've been trying to join this Daniel plan journey. And one of the ways as well I got involved was I joined a netball team. Now, disclaimer, this is a volleyball. Uh, however, my netball team needed our netball while I am back here. So just pretend it's a netball for this. And so I joined a netball team. And you see, when you play netball, as much as I'd like to think the credit is all mine when we win, sadly, it is not. It is a team sport. You see, what happens in netball is when you catch the ball, you're not allowed to move. I can't just catch the ball, run along to the goal, and just score a pass. That's just not how it happens. You catch the ball, you stop, you've got to pass. You've got to pass it to someone else in the team, and then you've got to run, reposition, and get ready to catch it again. It's a team sport. And I thought, hey, this is so much like our discipleship. Because so often we've got churches that, that are catching balls and they're like, ha ha, I've got my gospel. I'm safe, I'm off to heaven. And we're running and we're living our, my potential, my life, my dreams, my plans, you know, and it's all about me. But actually, God's like, you've got the ball, why? Because you're on a team, you're called to pass. Hey, there's a generation that are struggling with anxiety and you've been there and you know how to do it. Hey, can we pass that to you? Can you go and, and do that? Hey, we've got a kids camp and we need some help. Hey, can we pass that ball to you? Can you catch it and come help with that? There's elements that we all have, we all have a different role. I play goal defense at the moment because um, when I was about to join the team, uh, my friend accidentally thought I was six foot. Turns out I'm five five, in case you're wondering. Uh, and so I arrived and everyone was like, she doesn't look six foot. So my, my friend tried to make it up by saying, no, but she's got long arms. So I just stand there pretending I know what I'm doing with all these six foot women. Like, you know, it's fake it until you make it and all that, right? And so I play goal defense at the moment. And so my position on that team is very different to the goal shooter on the team. See, the goal shooter's job is to stand in the D, not move very much, but when she gets the ball, just get it in the net. That, that's it, like, get it, oh, oh, it's in there, good job. My job, I'm not even allowed to the net. They're like, Nadine, we know you're gonna be terrible at that. So we're gonna draw this line and just stop there so you don't mess it up. So goal defenses are allowed to the line and you're not allowed past it. We've all got a different role on the team. But there's something that we all have to do. We all have to catch the ball, and pass the ball. It doesn't matter what your role is, we all have to catch it and we all have to pass it. See, if someone went through the ball to me and I just, oh, oh, I'm off, I'm over here, like I've not done my part for the team, I've lost the ball. And see, some of us, we've had a generation before us that have told us about Jesus and we're off, we're off doing our own thing. We're like, I'm not catching that ball, that gospel, that's not for me. And so there's a time, you see, that we have to be able to catch what has been given. The opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Saviour is not going on forever and ever and ever. There's a time to receive, to catch that ball. And if you miss it, then you've missed it. And so there's a time to catch what has been given to you. And there's also a time to pass. I can't hold this ball forever because if I hold it, we're getting no shots in that net. We're not getting, we're not advancing, we're not doing any better. We'll all go home and everyone will be standing and be like, what are you doing today? And I'm like, oh, I rolled the ball, but all right. Like, it, it, I'm not doing anything. We all, have, we all have to catch what has been given to us and we all have to pass what we have. But when I stand on this line that we're only allowed up to, and the goal shooters and the goal attacks are doing their thing, I don't just, oh, well, that's not me. I guess I'll, I'll head off up here. Hey, how y'all doing? How's your lunch going? Uh, no, I, I don't, I stand on this line, and you know what I do? I go, good job, you got it. Good job, keep going, try. You're doing great, I'm proud of you. Good job, I cheer them on. I give them some praise. And sometimes I do go, shut up, Nadine. And I'm like, oh, but I love it. I, I give them some praise, why? Because everyone needs a little bit of encouragement. And what would it look like if we had a generation that said, maybe Maybe I've come to a line that I can't get over. I can't go back to year seven. The law would have something to say about it. There's boundaries that I can't get back to. There's some environments and industries that I'm never going to be able to get into. My opportunity of going into the tech business has long passed. I do not have the capacity for that.
that. But some young people start going into it and it's places that I personally won't go. It's places that I'm personally not in. Neighbourhoods, schools, environments, friendships that I'm not in. But you know what I do? I stand on the sideline and I cheer them on. I stand on the sideline and I say, you've got it. I believe in you. You're doing great. Keep on going. I praise them. But I also offer some perspective. Because as I stand on this sideline and they're all running frantically around, desperately trying to get this ball, I, 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 I've got a bit of a different perspective to they do. As you're ducking and diving and you're running, you can't really see where you're going. I stand in a clarity and I say, hey, pass to attack. She's free. Hey, hey, hey go shoot her. Move up. Yeah, they're free. Why? Because I can see it from a different perspective. What would it look like if we had a generation that have been there, that have done it, that have got a bit more experience, that have got a bit more wisdom, and they stood there and they just give a little bit of advice. They just stood there and they just took someone under their wing and they just said, hey, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna help you a little bit. I'm gonna guide you a little bit. I'm gonna make sure that you don't feel on your own when you're out there doing your thing in places that I'm not. I want you to know that you can come back to me. I also shout, hey, here if you need here if you need. See, the desire is not to have to pass back to me because we're getting further from the goal. But you only get three seconds to hold the ball. So if after three seconds, you, you, there's no one available, it's safer to pass it back because you've still got it on the team. So every time someone gets the ball, I go, here if you need, here if you need. And what I'm doing is I'm letting them know, hey, if you're really stuck, if you're really panicking, if you really don't know what to do, I'm just here. Like, just pass it back. It's okay. Reposition yourself. We'll try again. It's okay. I'm here if you need. We might have people who've passed the ball on. Hey, I, I did my time of kids ministry. I've passed the ball on. But you know what? The kids team starting to get burnt, burnt out. They're starting to struggle. They, they don't really know what to do. You know what? I, I'm here if I need. Let me fill in. Let me come in for a month. Give you a month off. I'm here if you need. Pass it back to me for a little time. I can take another three seconds. Hey, you know what? You're getting a bit worn out with youth and, and someone's driving you crazy. Hey, I'm here if you need. Pass it back. Let me try and, and go and see if I, I can give it a go. And I'll take them to McDonald's and I, I'll see if I can try and dig away at that service a little bit of what it is that they're struggling with. Hey, I'm, I'm here if you need. And I want to ask you two questions this morning. The first one is, what are you holding? And the second is, what are you passing? See, it, it tells us that it, in Thessalonians, it said that, you know, we, not only should we share with you the gospel, but our lives as well. What are you holding? Because it says, hey, it's not just the gospel, it's by my whole life. In other words, what, what is it that's in your life that you can use to pass to the next generation? Maybe you've got a car. You know, every week I can pick up three youth and, and, and I can drive them to youth because I've got a car and I will be, that will be my investment of how I pass on to the next generation. You know what, I've got a front room. Hey, why don't we have a little youth alpha in mind? Why don't I start a connect group? Why don't I start something for those people that don't know Jesus? I've got a front room and hey, you know what, I can cook. Claire's a brilliant example of this. She always is so good at using her gift of, of cooking when we have events and stuff here at church. She goes, hey, what can I do? I've got hospitality. I've got cooking. Why don't every Sunday when someone new comes along who's younger than me in faith, I invite them over and I give them access to my life. I get to know them. You know what? I use what I have and I pass it to those younger in faith and in age. We pass what we have. In Matthew 25, we see uh, the parable of the sower. And the parable of the sower, uh, is, it's all about basic, the, the, the message, moral of the story, like spoiler alert. It's all about uh, not what you have, but what you do with what you have. It's not about how much you have. It's not about how, how big you have, not about how much money you have. It's not about how, how many houses you have. It's not about how much time you have. It's not about what you have. It's about what you choose to invest. It's about what you choose to pass along to the next generation. Because we only have so much time to pass it along. So what are you holding? What is it in your life right now that you can use to help someone else? What is it you can use in your life to help someone else know the love of Jesus, to hear the gospel? What is it you can do? What is it you have in your life that you can help someone come and join in? Hey, you know what? I go shopping every week to Morrison's. Why don't I just invite someone to come along and the whole way around the shop, I'll just chat through them. I'll mentor them. I'll just hear how they're doing. I'll give them some advice. And it's something I'm already doing. It's not time on my schedule, but hey, come along when I go to Morrison's and we'll spend that hour together getting, uh, getting to know each other. What am I doing? Well, I've, I've got a 
a shopping trip at Morrison's, but I'm passing it along. I'm using it as an investment. And what, what are you passing? So what are you holding and what are you passing? See, as I said, when you get the, the netball, you get three seconds, and then you've got a, the whistle will blow if you've had it for longer than three seconds. And if that whistle blows, the ball goes down. The opportunity to pass that ball is now passed. It's the other team's ball. And in the same way, we will all have a day in our life when the whistle is blown. We will all have a day in our life when our opportunity to pass what we have will be gone. We will all have a day where we're not here anymore and we will hopefully be with Jesus uh, and that day to pass what we have while we're here will be gone. We have to pass it now. We've got to serve now, give now, love now. You've got to be generous now. Tell people about Jesus now. Why? Because this time to pass it is not forever. This time to pass will go. I want to kind of close on on a scripture that I think is one of the saddest scriptures in the Bible. And it's in the book of Judges. Uh, And it's chapter 2. And it says this in verse 7. It says, The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua. And the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. In other words, there's this guy called Joshua, and he's pretty great. And he loves Jesus, and he serves Jesus really well, and everyone around him serving Jesus really well. But then, then he dies, and all of his other leaders die with him. And, and then we get to verse 10 when everyone's dead. And in verse 10 it says this, after that, after everyone's passed away, the whole generation... Uh, had been gathered to their ancestors, and another generation grew up that neither, uh, who, who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Well, why is it important to pass? Why? Because if we don't pass, a generation will grow up never knowing what we held. A generation will grow up never knowing the testimony of God's faithfulness in your life. A generation will grow up never knowing what God has given you, never knowing what God has done for you, never knowing who God is. A generation will come. You see, Joshua is one of the best leaders in the whole Bible. I mean, he, he was with Moses. Uh, uh, Joshua, he, he was in Egyptian slavery. He saw the Red Sea part. Like imagine that, the sea is just like opening for me to walk through. I wish that happened. I, I, I just, I don't, I don't see that when I go to the beach. And, and he sees this Red Sea part, like he's seen some amazing things. He often went with Moses to the tabernacle. He was with Moses when he went up the hill and Moses got the Ten Commandments and had this fit and, and smashed them. He, he saw for 40 years manna fall from the sky, food for them to eat, the provision of God. He saw so much. He saw the Jordan River pushed back so that he could walk through to Jericho. He got to Jericho. He saw the walls fall down of Jericho. He's one of only two people to have gone from slavery to have gone to the promised land. Joshua, he saw supernatural things, things that I've yet still to see. I saw amazing, amazing things. He had no doubt that Jesus was real. He knew what he'd seen and Joshua died and the next generation didn't know. They didn't know God. They didn't follow God. Why? He, he died with the ball in his hand. It's so important for us not to get comfortable. Sit on the timeout bench. Hey, we've done our part. If you're alive right now, God has still got something for you to do. We're only ever one generation away from that. We've got a responsibility and a duty to pass on what we have, to give them opportunity to stretch muscles that they don't even know they have yet. We've got an opportunity to change the story that generations will tell from the decisions that we make today. Because if we don't do it, who will? If we don't pass, who will? I want to finish with uh, one thing that I want you to know and one thing that I want you to do. And the one thing that I want you to know is that the most significant thing you can ever, ever do is to raise up another to pass or to hold, sorry, that which you've been entrusted with. The most significant thing you can ever, ever do is raise up another to hold that which was entrusted to you. The most significant thing you can do 
is invest in the next generation. The most significant thing you can ever do is come alongside someone younger than you in age and faith and help them see an example to become more like Jesus. That's the call of God. That's your purpose. That's the reason you're here. That's the, the whole reason every single one of us are, are on this planet right now. It's to go and make disciples. It's to be parents. That's what I want you to know. And the one thing I want you to do If you want to join in, I'd love that this week you decide one day that you're going to pray on that one day for how God wants you to respond to this message. Is there a person that he's asking for you just to get alongside? Is there a ministry that he wants you to get involved in? Maybe you could fast as well at the same time if, if you want to, but why don't you really get on your knees and go, Jesus, I don't want to get to the finish line and see Jesus face to face. And he goes, oh, you missed it. You loved me so well and you followed me so well, but oh, why have you still got the ball in your hand? You've missed it. So why don't you spend one day just praying, a, a day where you maybe give up food and in those times you just say, God, I don't want to miss it. God, what am I holding and how do I pass it? Will you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you so much that you invite us into this journey with you. you. You want to do your great commission with us. You don't need us, but you invite us. And God, I ask that you will help us to not be a generation that drops the ball, but a generation that holds it well, that loves you well, that shares our lives well, but a generation that more importantly passes it on. Will you help us to know who it is that you're wanting us to parent ministries that we can get involved in to help pass it on to the next generation.